So what I want to do is we're going to open by trying to define what health is, because that's what I want to kind of focus on tonight, is, is starting out with a broad-based definition of health, and then particularly relate that back to your body from an anatomical and physiological standpoint, and then talk to you about how chiropractic plays a role in that, or how chiropractic can play a very key role in your health and stuff. So if we were going to define health, what I want to do is I want to try and just put up some, um, some parts of the definition, and you can't be wrong, you know, it's like a... It's like, you know, having a urine test. You can't study for it and be wrong. You know you, you, you know, you do it or you don't do it, right? So you can't be wrong when we start to define this thing, okay? So all I want you guys to do is if we were going to define, right, if we were going to define what health is, what would be some of the key ingredients in your perspective? And again, you can't be wrong when we're defining health. What would they be? Anybody? Nervous energy. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> all right. There's brownie points over here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Could you be a little more, uh, you know, descript there, Michelin? No, I just, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, we need a nervous system. That's good. I like that. Okay, <laughs> and you know, when I started to teach a lot, I immediately got a lot more respect for my grade five teacher, Mrs. Harris, you know, because this lady could be talking, and she was right-handed, she could be talking and writing with her left hand and, you know, make these perfect block letters and stuff. I can't, you know, I can't face the stupid board and make it work, you know, so. Okay, we gotta have a nervous system, we know that. What, other, what are some sort of commonly held beliefs about, about your health and how you define your, how do you know if you're healthy or not? I mean, physically active, okay, so physically active, I like that. I think that's part of it, yeah. What else? What else can we do? Nutrition. nutrition, yeah, I agree. Ooh, I like that. Okay, now don't somebody throw a word at me that I can't spell, okay? It's gonna look bad on the on the report here, okay? <laughs> any, any what other things? How else do we define whether we're healthy or not? What are the wholeness? Okay. C can you go into a little more detail in or can you just extrapolate a little bit? Okay, the, the entire person, if you will. Okay, I like that. Anybody else want to add to this? Now I'm going to start pointing, right? No, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, um, let me ask you this. Outside of the nervous system, which is part of the right answer, um, can you be uh, not physically active and be healthy? I'm going to say I have some people, some patients who've never done any physically active in their life and are technically alive. Whether how healthy they are, you know, that remains to be seen. How about uh, could you? Pr are there people that practice bad nutrition and are still alive, somewhat healthy? Yeah. Okay. How about uh, how about some, anybody here know anybody with a really crappy attitude who's still alive and sort of you know <laughs> functioning at that some level? Yeah, I, I know a few of those too. Um, no, none of them that work for me though. No, none of those people. You know. Um, how about uh, wholeness and stuff? Is there? Can you be? Can you have an organ system missing and still be healthy? Mm, okay, so that, I mean, you start to get into some paradoxes, don't you? It's like, well, how do we define health? What does it really mean to be healthy? One of the most common things that people um, think about when we start talking about health is they often talk about how they feel. You know, and I say, well, I feel good, therefore I must be healthy. And yet 57 times in Ontario every day, someone wakes up who goes into a healthcare provider's office, either a chiropractor or a doctor, and is told that that ache or the pain that they have is cancer and they felt fine yesterday, right? So how you feel isn't always, isn't always necessarily a good indicator. The World Health Organization defines health as an optimum or a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmities, okay? Let me say that again. An optimum state or a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease and infirmities. Okay? And yet in our society for hundreds of years, we've been told that if you feel good, then you're healthy. Right? That's, I mean, that's what we're taught. People have been taught that for years and years and years. And yet, I like the World Health Organization's definition, which comes from Dorland's Medical Dictionary, because it doesn't, it doesn't just define how you feel in the moment. It defines a complete state or an optimum state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So if we went back to some of our examples already, we talked about wholeness. By that definition, a complete state or an optimum state, if you had an organ system missing, could you ever be truly healthy by that definition? No, you couldn't be, could you, right? So therefore, you've already lost part of your ability to be healthy if you lose 
part of your organ systems, if you lose part of your ability to be whole. Um, mental capabilities was something that was brought up, and I think that's real important because it's part of that definition. It takes it outside of just the physical realm, and we're starting to realize the more research we do that, that what happens up here, what happens in our mind, in our emotions, has a great deal of influence on what's happening inside of our body. Dr. So listen, let's talk about the two models that exist, because there are two models of healthcare in our society today. The one model of healthcare, which was predominantly the way a lot of people in our society, Western culture particularly, were raised, the way I was raised, um, is what we call a crisis care model of health, okay? We don't look so much at that sort of definition that I defined earlier, but they focus a lot on, on how we feel. And if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it, right? If it doesn't hurt, then don't worry about it. Right? This, is the, this is the crisis care mentality. And what does that do? It means that if you feel good, then you must be healthy. Eh, wrong. Not always necessarily the case. And it's not like you need to be some sort of a sadist where you say, well, geez, if I hurt, is that a good thing? I mean, no, the two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive concepts. However, how you feel is not always tied to necessarily how you are. So if you're just using how you feel as an indicator for whether you're healthy or not, it can really affect a lot of healthcare decisions that you're going to make. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, okay? So there's the crisis care model. That's kind of like over here. The other model of healthcare, which a lot of people feel is just emerging now into our society, which truthfully has been around since time eternal, is, is more of a wellness or a preventative model of healthcare, where we say, I'm not just going to worry about how I feel in the moment in terms of whether I decide to eat healthy, for example. Somebody mentioned good nutrition, right? I'm not just going to decide you know, whether I exercise today just based upon how I feel or not. You know what I mean? It's like focusing on, on your whole being, mentally, physically, socially, spiritually, in my opinion, all the way through all the seven aspects of your life and trying to maintain some sort of optimum balance in that direction. Focusing on things, you know, what some people would consider on a preventative level, by trying to keep your body functioning at optimum all the time. And remember what the World Health Organization says, an optimum state of physical, mental, and social well-being, right? We want to try and keep our bodies working at max all the time. Now, here's a concept that I want to, I want to bring up. I contend and I believe that it's our God-given right to be healthy. I think we were born that way. I think, it's, I think it's, it's part of who we are as little infant children. And I think that there are things that happen in our lifetime that screw it up, to put it in real plain English, OK? So in other words, I think that we were born to have an optimum state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease and infirmities. I think that was our, that was our you know, in my language, our God-given right. That was something we were, that was born into us. But there are things that get in the way that kind of mess that up. And that's some of the stuff that I want to talk about tonight. What are those things? What are those pitfalls? What are the things we should be watching for? The big picture behind all this is that tonight you're going to get confronted with the two models of healthcare: the crisis care model, which some of you here probably live in, and, and the wellness care model, which says that um, I want to try and keep my body working at optimum all the time. I want to keep my being, my, my whole being, as Anne said, working you know, at its optimum all the time. Because what I find when I teach a lot around North America is that usually people live kind of in both worlds. For example, how many people here uh, have tooth pain every day of their life? We hear of tooth pain every day? No. How many people here brush their teeth every day? Right? Okay. Is that, is that crisis care or is that preventative wellness care? Preventative wellness care, obviously, right? I mean, that's, you're, you're trying to prevent your body from, from breaking down and having problems, okay? How about this one? How many people here um, have an automobile or, or know someone who has an automobile <laughs> that, uh, that uh, they either tune up or change the oil or, you know, do something to it in a preventative way every six months or 6,000 kilometers or whatever, right? And, I mean, you know, so again, which is that? Crisis care, preventative care? Preventive care, obviously, okay? So, and a lot of people, most of the people here do that, and I find that as they teach. Let me ask you this then. How many people here um, know they should exercise more than they do, but they don't? <laughs> right? At least 90% of the hands, okay? All right? Crisis care or preventative care? Well, I think that's more crisis, isn't it? Right? That's like, because you feel okay, you say, you know, I didn't exercise yesterday, and I got through the day, so therefore, you know, maybe if I don't exercise tomorrow, maybe I can get through the day, and you know what I'm saying? What I find was that most people that I talk to in our Western culture live in both worlds. They have one foot in the sort of preventative wellness optimum state of being world, and they have another foot that exists in the crisis care world. And they, they're kind of caught in this, you know, what we often call in healthcare the, the cross paradigm debate, where they're, they're kind of living in both worlds. So one of the things I hope to get clear tonight is that you can get a chance to look at both worlds. You can look at how you may or may not fit into both worlds. And you can make some decision, either on a conscious or an unconscious level, to decide whether that's whether how you live your life from this moment forward is how you want to continue to live your life. Right? Let me show you something. Let me share something with you. I contend this. I think that life is like a great big wheel. Okay? And I know this isn't going to show up very well in the video, but maybe we can just zoom in or something. Okay? And I contend that at the center of that wheel, 
And if I'm really, really careful here, I'm going to come up with pretty much seven spokes on this wheel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And I contend that there are seven um, very distinct um, parts to our life, if you will. There's obviously the mind or the mental part, okay? There's the physical part. There is this thing called spirit or spirituality. There is a family part of our lives. There's this dreadful thing or sometimes wonderful thing called financial aspect of our lives. That always brings a laugh somehow. I don't know. It's like there's this inbred fear in there. And then most people have a career, and I don't know if that's spelled with two E's or an E and an A, but we'll just, you guys uh, get the, the basic idea. And then, of course, there is the social area of our lives. Okay? And I contend that you can take any aspect of your life and you can break it down and it's going to fit into one of these seven categories. Okay? Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because, as the World Health Organization defines health as an optimum state, physical, mental, and social well-being, I would like to take that definition and just include it in not only a state of um, physical, mental, and social well-being, but spiritual, family, and so on. And here's why. I believe that who you are inside, what you believe about yourself and your life, is demonstrated by how you live your life. Okay, one of my favorite authors, Ralph Waldo Emerson, says, what you do speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying, you know? And uh, the Buddha, one of my favorite Buddhist quotes, says that um, to, to know but, to, but not to act is to, in fact, not to really know, you know? So I would contend that how you live your life in all of these seven areas is a reflection of who you are inside. Who you are inside is a direct result of your beliefs in terms of who you are, how you live your life. The psychologists tell us that truly 80% of those belief systems are formed by the time we're six years old, six years old. So who has the biggest influence on what we believe about ourselves and our world? Me. Yes. <laughs> and who started those belief systems? I believe our parents did, and I believe our parents handed them on to us and so on. So they say by 90, 95% by the age of 12, your belief systems are formed about who you are, how you view your world, and what you do. So for example, how you interact with your friends is largely dependent upon how your parents taught you how to interact with friends and so on and so on. Now you have the ability to change that, and I believe that's strong, but the, there is that base there. Now, this is what we call the, the wheel of life, okay? Now, why do I put health at the center of the wheel of life? I put health at the center because I contend that we need to ensure that health is a priority in our life. Why? Because I believe that if we do not have health as a priority in our life, then all of the other areas of our life will suffer. For example, if we do not have our health, we're flat out in bed sick or in a hospital bed or something like that, can you go to work? No, you can't, right? And for most of us, if we don't work, we don't get paid, right? So our health has a direct influence on our career, and our livelihood, and therefore our, our sense of financial stability as well, correct? How about our family? Can you enjoy your family when your head's hanging in the toilet bowl? No, of course you can't, right? So that's another aspect. Um, spirituality, one of the places that I really saw people get in touch with their spirituality is when they get really, really sick. And it's like, you know, please God or whatever their, their, their being is, it's like, you know, I'll do whatever I got to do here, get me through this, you know? Um, physically, you, can you enjoy your physical aspects of your life? You're running, you're jumping, you're playing, you're dancing, whatever it is you do? Of course you can. Mentally, just how many people when you're really, really sick just don't even want to think? They don't want to do anything, right? And as you go through this entire thing, you can't enjoy your friends if you're unwell. You see where I'm driving with this? What I'm saying is that your health is a cornerstone for a lot of things that you have and do in your life. And yet our health is one of those things which unfortunately we take entirely for granted until we don't have it. And then we'll do anything to get it back. Crisis care, wellness care, right? The two models. And our society is hopelessly caught in this debate, even though we don't even know there is a debate going on. We're hopelessly caught. We're, trying, we're living kind of in both worlds. Now, here's an interesting thing, just about the few examples I brought up earlier. What's the worst case scenario? You never brush your teeth. You never look after your teeth a day in your life. What's the worst thing that can happen to your teeth? They all fall out, and you get false ones, right? What's the worst thing that happens if you don't look after your vehicle, your car, and stuff? What's the worst thing that happens? You, you walk, or you get another one, or you, you, right? Yet your body, right? We all said, most people here said they know they should eat better and they should exercise more, and yet they don't. So there's two things we can totally replace, which are basically sort of, you know, almost monetarily driven, if you will, and the thing that we can't replace, our body, we don't look after it. It, it. it doesn't jive, does it? Just something doesn't fit there for me. Why would we do that to ourselves? Well, we're obviously not stupid people. I think the reason is because we've been trained for years to believe that if we feel okay, if we don't have any pain, then we're healthy. I'm here tonight, among many other things, to dispel, totally dispel that myth, because it's absolutely, absolutely not true. It takes 8 to 12 years for enough cancer cells to develop to a point where you actually start to feel any symptoms from that. They tell us it takes 20 to 30 years for the arteries in your heart to close down to a point where you actually start to feel any sort of congestive 
pain or, or any problems with that whatsoever. Right? This thing we're going to talk about tonight called the subluxation, which is a chiropractic term, which refers to a decrease in energy flow through your body. Again, it's the same sort of thing. It happens slow process over years. And by the time I meet people, lots of times, there's off, already an awful lot of damage done to the body. And we're trying to correct something that's 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years old. Average person in, this, in the province of Ontario spent $2,548 on their health care in 1994. It's the last statistics I have. Is health care free in our society? No. Why do we pay so much good taxes in our particular province? It's because we have a very, very expensive health care system. And yet, think about our health care system. When do you enter our health care system? When you're healthy or when you're sick? When you're sick. So that's a health care system, or is that a sickness care system? Think about that, right? It seems kind of hot, doesn't it? In China, interesting, in China, they're moving towards more of a Western type of a, of a health care system. But um, in fact, in China, for years, their system was set up differently. They actually had a health care system. And in that system, what you would do, for the sake of argument, uh, just to pick a figure, you would give a doctor uh, $1,000 to keep you healthy for the year. Okay. Every time you got unwell or were less than optimum health or not whole, you'd go and take a little money back. Interesting system, huh? Right? He now has an incentive, or that person would have an incentive to keep you well, to keep you healthy, to keep you optimum, to keep you whole. In a crisis care system, think about it. You enter the system when you're unwell. They only get paid if you're unwell. And then they're supposed to get you well so that you never come back so they never make any money. I mean, thank God 99.99% .99 of all health care providers are ethical people, or our system would be totally bankrupt, right? <laughs> right? But I mean, the system, in my opinion, is set up a little bit in reverse. And I want to talk to you about why I think that's like that. All righty. There are, in my opinion, just sort of following through with this, four essentials, absolutely essential things that you, you cannot live without on the planet Earth as a human being in order to have health, baseline health, okay? Now, I think there are other priorities, which will probably get intermixed in this as we talk about this together, but I think there are four essential things that you must have to be healthy on the planet. And I know from our earlier conversation that this is going to be actually easy to do. So what are the four things that, as a human being, you absolutely have to have to be alive on the planet? Food, yeah, I agree, 100%. What else? Keys to being healthy, if you will. Yes and no. We'll talk about that, Mr. Okay. Anybody? Water. Water, yes, for sure. Hey, there's the, there it is. It's, the, it's like so obvious you'd miss it, right? What's number four? Sorry? <laughs> well... I don't know, I was a student for many years. I didn't have any of it, I was still alive, so. <laughs> well, but actually, let's, let's focus on that for a second, because what, what is money in a sense? It's an exchange of what? It's an exchange, an exchange. And, and in my terms, I, I think that money is just a way to, to transfer uh, time and talent is really all it is. It's like an exchange of energy. Oh, there's that word again. Why don't we just stick that right in here, okay? Let's look at some of these things. Let's look at oxygen, for example. <clears throat> oxygen, obviously, is something we have to have. If we cut the oxygen supply off in this room, I mean, you know, it's bye-bye, it's, you know, Charlie, right? We're not going to live very long. If we were to just decrease the quality, um, the quality and or the uh, quantity of oxygen in this room, and let's do it sort of slowly over a period of time, would we increase our, our, our ability to be healthy or would we decrease it? Decrease it, obviously, right? Okay. Let's take water, for example. Instead of drinking, you know, nice pure northern Ontario water, let's go and, you know, drink it out of Lake Ontario, straight out, right? Right near the Pickering Nuclear Station, someplace really, you know, neat like that. Um, decreasing the quality and or the quantity of the water we have. Healthier or sicker? And that's so obvious, right? What about the quality quantity of food we have? Right? No disrespect to Donnie Miller's gang over McDonald's, but let's just say that we ate, you know, three meals a day there for the next 30 days. More well or less well? Less well. What would happen to our energy system if we did the same thing? We decrease the quantity or quality of energy flowing through our body. Right? It's so obvious, right? We're going to decrease that. So let's look at this in terms of real extremes. We take oxygen. How long can you live without oxygen? If you were to just like, stop and just hold your breath right now, how long can you go? Let's just say, yeah, I've heard different things. I've heard three minutes, five minutes. I've heard different things. But it's, it's definitely minutes. Would you agree? Right? Minutes. You, you're, you're gone. How about water? How long can you go without water? It's two or three days is what, I, of what I've you know, heard from different experts, too. But definitely it's days. It's not weeks. You can't go a week without water. You just perish. Um, food. How long can you go without food? Yes. I would say it's weeks. I've heard tell of, uh, I remember this uh, 
fellow who went in the IRA who did a hunger strike years ago and he lasted 36 days or something. And, you, know, so, you know, you can go a while without food. Um, how about energy? How long can you exist without energy flowing through your body? If you can't. It's like 0, 0.0. And yet, how many people here actually before, like just four minutes ago, actually realized that they even had an energy system in their body? And if they did, what it did for them and how it worked and all that sort of stuff, right? We've, we, most people understand the real basics of oxygen and water and food in terms of their life and how important it is and all that stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that they do it as well as they're supposed to, right? We, we already proved that earlier tonight. Not everybody here eats as well as they should, and myself included. Um, but energy is the one thing that we cannot live without, and yet it's the thing that is the most uh, misunderstood or the least understood in terms of our entire system of, of, of function and matter in our body. I contend that these three things, these three priorities here, these three essentials, the top three, make up the material or the matter part of our existence, okay? And then, of course, the last part is energy. And if you've studied any of the works of Albert Einstein and some of his cronies, um, you know, Einstein believes that matter and energy are interchangeable the closer you get to speed of light squared, which is his very famous theory of relativity, right? So he says that, you know, this is just, this is this, this material stuff that I have that is my body, that you see as my body, is really just uh, empty space with patterns of energy running through it, which is just a fascinating concept to me and stuff. But anyway, the, what I want you to understand or take from that is that, yes, there are important things that we need in our body, and energy is one of them. Now, what is this energy and what does it do? Well, first, what system in our body does the energy use to get around? Anybody know? Oh, there it is. She beat you to it, Michelle. She <laughs> it is our nerve system, right? And our nerve system is really is, is, starts in our brain, and it runs down through uh, the spinal cord, and then it exits out through all the little spaces between the vertebrae we call the, uh, the spinal nerve roots. Okay? And then from there, it branches and branches and branches and branches and goes out for you know, literally time eternal. They say that every cell of the 400 trillion, and I've heard as many things as 400 quadrillion, cells in our body. I, 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 would, you know, I can always picture some university student at Sir Sanford Fleming or something, you know, sitting there with a microscope, you know, 4,750, 4,750. How do you count these things? I have no idea how you count the cells of the body. But anyways, there's an awful lot of them. What they say, Carl Sagan said in his book, The Dragons of Eden, Eden is that there are approximately um, uh, 10 to 12 different nerves that converge on each and every cell of our body. So you can imagine you take that particular large nerve root there and you branch it and branch it and branch it down to the microscopic cell level. And then there's 10 to 12 little tentacles that come out to go to that cell. Now here's the thing that kind of takes me for a loop when I start to get into these numbers. He claims that there are 100,000 little synaptic connections, little cleft feet, if you will, that come from each one of those 10 to 12 nerves, which actually make contact with the cells. If you do the math on that, it's between a million and 1,200,000 actual contacts energy contacts onto each and every cell of our body, and they're somewhere in the region of 400 tr um, trillion to 400 quadrillion cells in our body. I mean, do the math on that. I, <laughs> I get lost somewhere out there in, you know, in space and time. I have no idea. But it's a very, very complex, very, very intricate system and stuff. If you believe either in evolution or designer to the body, it doesn't matter to me, but you have to believe that whatever allowed our body to be created is, believes that that energy system is real important because it has put such a finite and such a large branch of nerve structure out there to make sure that the energy actually gets through, okay? And that energy, as I said, is literally one of the very, very key ingredients to keeping our body alive. If we take our energy system and shut it off, where do we go? I mean, it's such an obvious thing. We just, we just leave the planet. We just vacate, right? We're not here. As we said, if we decrease the quality or quantity of energy coming into our body or flowing through our body, we would have less health or more health? Which was the answer? We'd have reduced ability to be healthy. Less, less, exactly. We'd have less optimum potential to be healthy. Would you necessarily feel that right away? No, you wouldn't necessarily feel that right away. If you live in a crisis care world and all you worry about is how you feel day to day, do you care? No, you don't care. If you live in a wellness optimum function model, do you care? Yeah, and if you don't, you should. Because if we're trying to get your body and your, 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 your being to be all that it can be, to function at its highest level, at its optimum, mentally, physically, socially, spiritually, all the way through, you want to make sure you have proper energy flow. Without it, you just vacate the planet. Okay? So what I want to do is go through a little wee bit of anatomy and physiology with you with respect to this system and how it functions and stuff to try and bring across to you a couple of key concepts that I think really relate strongly to the wellness care or, or preventative care model of healthcare versus the crisis care model. And I'll show you why I believe there's some things that we should be addressing here. Okay? 
When the um, fetus is forming, the very, very first system that's formed is, in fact, the neurological system, okay? And it is formed at around 18 days gestation, very, very, very soon. You get these two little, wee, tiny little cells coming together, and in 18 days, you're starting to form the most complex system in the entire universe today. Nothing is more complex in our nervous system that we've discovered yet, at least, okay? 18 days, that always blows me away. And it starts out as a very primitive brain, and then it has to have a way to connect or to send that energy to the other body parts. So it grows a tail. It's like a tadpole kind of a thing, okay? Now, rather than like a tadpole losing its tail and turning into the frog prince, um, what it does is it starts to send out branches of information to start to be able to get to the other more involved parts of our body. It's a very, very complex system we have, our, our, this, this internal intelligence that's inside of our body that, that tells us, you know, to grow a spinal cord, to grow spinal nerves, to allow our body to sense the fact that it's cooling down in here and our, our heart rate is adjusting and our respiration rate is adjusting and our vascular system is, is regulating. And all that feedback mechanism, all that internal dialogue, if you will, that's going on all the time. They say at the rate of approximately 100 million sensory bits of information every second. 100 million sensory bits. That's just mind-blowing to me. It really is. Two and a half million brand new cells formed in our body every minute. So let's just say you guys have been here, I would like to say 15 minutes, but probably closer to half an hour. If you do the math on that, I mean, you've had 70 million brand new cells formed inside your body since you sat down here. 70 million brand new cells. I mean, how does it know to grow your nose in the same spot every time? Right? That always kind of amazes me. If you do that math out on the number of cells that are in the body, they say that 98.6% of our body is replaced every physical year. How does it know to do that? It always grows the spleen in the same spot. It always puts the ear in the same place. It always knows exactly whether you ate a highly complex carbohydrate meal or a high fatty meal. It secretes different amounts of enzymes, different quantities of bile from the liver. I mean, your body's constantly regulating and doing all these things. It's a very intelligent system. And this little thing up here is mission control. It's what runs the whole show. So just from a, if we didn't say anything else tonight, we just ended it right now, from a common sense standpoint, do you think it would make sense to make sure that this always talk to your body and then receive the information back? At the rate of 100 million sensory bits of information per second? Yeah, I'd say that's real, real important. That, in an essence, is chiropractic. Making sure that that system is working the way it was designed to do so you can you know, receive and generate information, okay? I want to go through a couple little detail pieces, though, as we work through this, this concept, okay? Again, real quick, make sure everybody was still with us. If we shut this system off, what happens? Bye. If we shut the system off here, what would happen from here down? Dead, right? No, no energy, no function. Just doesn't happen, okay? If we did it from cut at the nerve here so that no energy could flow down and out through that part, what would happen from here out? Dead, right? Just, I mean, wherever you cut the energy flow off, it dies. It needs to have energy. Just as if you took the, 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 you know, the blood supply to my hand and just, just radically you know, altered it here. I mean, right away, I might not feel a lot, but by tomorrow morning, I'd probably be singing pretty bad. You know? I mean, that's how they've been cutting sheep's tails off for thousands of years in New Zealand. right? There's a little elastic around the tail, cut the blood flow off, and the thing dies. The way it goes. You have to have those four essentials, oxygen, water, food, and energy flowing to every cell in your body every second of the day where that body cell is on a declining, a declining scale, if you will. It's, it's getting weaker. Do you necessarily feel that all the time right away? Oh, you guys were listening. That's good. I like that. That's good. Okay. So, now we made a, 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 an assumption earlier, or, or probably assumption is the best way to say it. We said that if we decrease the quality or quantity of energy flowing into a body part, that that body part would become weaker or stronger? Which was it? Weaker, right? Okay. All right. So, let me just show you the research that was done on that real, real quick. It was done by a man at the uh, University of Colorado named Dr. Su, Dr. Hun Su. And I can actually try and make this neat because we're on film tonight. I want people to think that I actually, you know, went to grade school, okay? Um, and what I'm trying to attempt to, to, to illustrate here, and my art skills are, are uh, the only thing that's worse my art skills are my singing skills, so. Maybe we can work on that someday, that's <laughs> right. What I'm trying to illustrate here is a group of cells, okay? Now, in three dimensions, of course, they'd be cubes, right? They're just because we've got to think about this in three dimensions. But I'm going to draw two dimensions here as, a, as, a, as basically a square. And what we have here is a nerve sending what into those cells? Messages, energy, life, prana, life force, whatever word you want to use for it, okay? Now, would it come in just as one big lump like that? No. Every one of these cells would have how many inputs? 10 to 12 nerve inputs, 
with 100,000 feet, synaptic feet per nerve cell. Wow, I'm not going to sit here and draw all those little details, okay? Those are like finer than fiber optic tables. But anyways, I want you to get the idea. Now, again, real quick, if we cut this nerve, what happens to this nerve and all these cells? Die. Okay. Now, what we said earlier, what we assumed earlier, much as we did with oxygen and food and water, was that if we weaken that system or decrease the quality or quantity, we would decrease the energy flow and therefore make the system weaker, right? That was our, that was our assumption. And this is the work that Dr. Sue did. Here's what he did. He took, he was working on, on animals, he was working on dogs, and what he did was he took a little plastic foot here that had like a, a little tail on it so he could control it, and he would put it underneath the nerve. And then up here he would take a balloon and he would literally blow the balloon up to different amounts of pressure, compressing the nerve between the foot plate and the balloon. Because if we use something metal or sharp or something on this, we'd damage this nerve forever. Okay, so we didn't want to damage him, we just wanted to bother him. He didn't want to cut it because we said if we cut it, what happens? Dies. Well, you guys are really on the ball. I like that. Okay, now I want to do a little demonstration for you. Just I want you to just play with me a little bit. Take a finger, just any finger. Take your index finger on your left hand. Hold it over your right hand, okay? And I want you just to go down and just gently, gently touch your the back of your hand until you can just feel it. Okay? You feel how light that is? Okay? It's just obviously there's a sensory threshold there as you can feel it at. That is approximately five to eight, some people say 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay, very, very, very small amount of pressure to activate that system. That's the amount of pressure that Dr. Sue started with, five to 10 millimeters of mercury, and he was blowing up the balloon to put pressure on the nerve, okay? If you were to put a voltmeter, for lack of a better term, to measure energy here, and you were to put a voltmeter in here, you would want the energy to be the same across. And this is basically this new technology that we have in the office, this new computerized neurological scanner. We can actually detect that energy flow. If you put pressure on here, our assumption was that we would decrease the energy flow across, therefore making the system weaker. Well, that's exactly what Dr. Sue found in his research. This is going back into the early 1970s. What he found was that within three minutes, he was seeing sometimes up to a 60% decrease in energy flow across that nerve, making those cells stronger or weaker? Weaker, obviously, okay. Now, the thing that alarmed him was that he found that within 20 minutes, he was starting to actually see trophic degenerative changes. Why is it in healthcare all the words are really long, right? It takes forever to write those out. Anyways, he started to see within 20 minutes, he started to see degenerative changes happening in the nerve and in the actual cell structure, okay? Now, does that make sense based upon our earlier assumptions, presumptions? Yes. If we did the same thing with the oxygen content into there, would we accomplish the same sorts of things? Yeah, we would, right? If we did the same thing with water or food content, I mean, we'd do the same sorts of things. The system would weaken, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to introduce you what I consider to be the key concept between the two models of healthcare, between the wellness preventative model of healthcare and the crisis care. Because I think when you truly understand the concept of threshold, I don't see how any rational person could actually ever live their life by crisis care again. When we decrease the energy flow through here, we said we weaken the system. Okay, so just for the sake of illustration, I'm going to show that weakened cell as a, I don't know, whatever that is, a little funny shaped oval or a circle or something, okay? Just to demonstrate that there's something different there, okay? So let's just say that it's been seven minutes since this little bit of nerve pressure happened, and we're starting to weaken this system. And now let's say we've got two weakened cells. Does this necessarily hurt yet? Is there any way for our body to know that this has happened yet? Not necessarily. So from a crisis care standpoint, does anybody really care? No, if you live in a crisis care world and all you're worried about is how you feel, you don't really care, right? You just, you just don't. But if you live in a world of optimum function and optimum being the, the best, the wholest person, if you will, you can be, should you care? Yeah, I contend that you should, okay? Now watch. If we leave this nerve pressure there longer, what did Dr. Sue find even within 20 minutes was he started to see even more degenerative changes happening, okay? So in other words, what he found was a pretty linear relationship between the amount of damage and the time that the interference was left there. So let's just, 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 and it used to work, I promise it used to work. Let's just walk through this thing then. We start to see more and more damaged cells. Now, we've got, whatever that is, six damaged cells versus the two we started with. Is this system working better or worse than it used to? worse, right? Does it necessarily, necessarily hurt yet? Does it necessarily, you know, stop functioning yet? Not necessarily. From a crisis care standpoint, do you care? From a wellness care standpoint, should you care? Yeah, if you're concerned about optimum state, 
of physical, mental, and social well-being. You should care, okay? So just watch, play with me here, right, as we go. Because, I mean, obviously, the longer we leave the interference there, the more damaged cells we have, okay? Finally, we cross a threshold. And this is the concept that I need to get across to you, the concept of threshold. We finally cross that magic threshold whereby the body finally says, enough is enough, Tom. Wake up and smell the roses, pal. There's something not correct in your body, okay? It's a built-in warning system that we have that, in my opinion, was put there by the designer of the body to let us know that something is incorrect, okay? Now, when those alarm bells goes off, those pain messages, those whatever those things are that start to cause you hurt, pain, agony, whatever it is, right? In a crisis care world, people get real excited. It's like, whoa, I've got a problem, and it's real bad, and it just started today. I had a fellow in today who was putting his, who was drying his foot in the shower this morning. And this was the position he came in when he saw me today. I mean, this is where he was. And when did it start, in his opinion? This morning, right? What caused it? Drying his foot in the shower. I said, Terry, have you ever, you know, dried off your foot in the shower before? Thousands of times. I said, well, what was different about this? I mean, were you real aggressive with it? You know, or, it's going, well, no, something doesn't make sense there, okay? So, and watch the concept of threshold. Let me give you an illustration, which I, I think I, I like. I makes it very clear to me anyways. And we got one of these fridges that, uh, you know, has the ice maker on it and the water dispenser and the little cradles and stuff, you know. I got four little girls at home. And our oldest girl at the time was a little over two. Just a little over two. Jara. And she thought she'd gone straight to heaven because these little cradles were like the little dispensers at McDonald's, you know, and she figured she was at McDonald's. You know, she could push the little cradle and she could make water happen. And it was a real <laughs> exciting time for her, I guess. I guess if you're two, you know. Anyways. What are you talking about? I had fun with it for ages, you know? You crushed ice, cubed ice. Anyways, um, and, and uh, what Jara would do was she, would, she couldn't, she was too short to reach the actual dispenser, so she'd have to pull a little stool up and stuff and get up on top of the stool and, you know, push the little thing, which was fine. I mean, you know, one of the things we don't want our children, at least our children we don't want to do, is to not want to drink water. However, what happened was twice she fell off the stool and she hurt herself. And we said, okay, that's it, Jara, no more water. Well, what Jara decided, right, being two, was that... Um, being Jara, yeah, exactly, Michelle knows Jara, uh, was that, that, you know, she wasn't going to be stopped. So what she did was she'd, she'd pull the stool up anyways, and, but she'd be pouring the water out of the cradle dispenser, but she'd be scoping for mom and dad, right? She just, you know, she wasn't going to, she wasn't stupid, she wasn't going to get in trouble, she was going to scope for mom and dad. And what ended up happening was Jara was filling her glass up, but she wasn't really paying close attention to what was going on. So the glass is half full. Do we have a problem or any difficulties yet? No, of course you don't. Your glass is half full. The glass is filled right up to the very brim. The, the very peak of threshold, we're at eight ounces of, of, of fluid here and stuff. Is there any immediate problems here? No. What happens if we put one more stupid drop of water inside that glass? Where does the water go? Right down on the floor. We had at, at least three incidents of a gallon and a half on the floor before Jared <laughs> realized, you know, what's happening out here. The scary thing was that when she got a little older, we still kept this rule going for a year or two, was she enlisted her little sister, Tess, to, like, stand guard, right? So <laughs> Tess would crawl around and peek around the corner of the cupboards and go, terrifies me to think they're going to be teenagers someday. Anyways, so I want, want, want you to answer this question for me. Think about this for a minute. There was an eight ounce threshold for volume for Jarrah's glass in this particular example. Okay? We agreed that as you fill it half up, it's not really a problem. You fill it right to the top, it really isn't a problem. It's only when you cross that threshold that there's a problem. Okay? So which drop of water that Jarrah put in her glass was the most important one? Was it the very, very first one she put in the glass? Was it one somewhere in the middle? Or was it the very last drop of water that she put in the glass that's the most important one? Okay, so let's ask. How many people think the first one was the most important one? Okay, so we got three first. How many people think one in the middle somewhere? Okay, nobody buys that one. How, about people, how many people think the last one? Still think the last one. Okay, so we're, we're kind of, we're almost split here and stuff, okay? I contend this. I contend that each drop of water that Jared put in her glass was equally important. Because there could be no last without a first, and there could be no first without a last. Are you with me on that? Okay. So in other words, you put in all of these drops and you get to the top one here, you know, it's not a problem until you put in that last drop. But you couldn't have a last drop unless you had a first drop. You understand? Okay. Watch the analogy here with our bodies. Okay. Now this group of cells, which group of cells is this in our body? It doesn't matter. It could be our big toe. It could be our left kidney. It could be our right atrium in our heart. It could be any part of our body because each and every part of our body must have a nerve supply. Right? It must have energy flow. If it doesn't have energy flow, it does not exist. It can't. It's physically impossible. 
You cannot animate this clay that we call our material body unless you have energy flow into it. Make sense? Okay, so we're, we're damaging our body. We might not be aware of it at the time. We're decreasing the quality and quantity of oxygen flow, water flow, you know, food intake into our body, or we're decreasing the energy flow into our body, which is this example, slowly weakening our body. More and more damage coming into our body until we cross that magic threshold and our body says, hey, guy, <laughs> you're hurting me up here. I now have a headache, I have a pain, I have an ache, I have a something that's happened inside my body, and our body's built-in intelligence screams out a message up here, which we interpret as pain of some form. Wow, try and write upside down with your broad hand. <laughs> hey, not bad. Um, and, and you get this pain message. Now, if you live in a crisis care world, now you're real excited, aren't you? Because you hurt. And you figure it happened just this morning when I was drying my foot in the shower. Correct? Be with me here? Right? Or, yeah, well, my kidney was just fine yesterday, Doc. I don't know why it's not working today. Accumulation of damage, accumulation of damage till we cross the threshold. Right? Does that make some sense to you guys? For years in our society, our health care, which I don't believe is a health care system, it's a, it's a disease care system because you only enter it when you're sick or diseased, okay, has focused entirely on this, right? What's been the primary focus in a crisis care world? Get rid of the pain. If you take chock full of a whole pile of you know, analgesic medications or something like that so that you don't feel the pain, are you having any effect on this? None whatsoever. How many people here, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How many people here have ever had a pain message of any form and chose to ignore it? Okay. How many people have ever had a pain message come into their body and rather than getting to the bottom of it, have taken you know, some sort of a painkiller so they didn't have to feel it, whether it's a bottle of Jack Daniels or a bottle of Tylenol 3? Right? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, right? Why would we do that? We're intelligent people. Why would we do that to ourselves? The only reason I contend we do that ourselves is because we believe that's all that you do. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Let me give you an example. We talked about brushing our teeth earlier. My 95-year-old grandmother, God love her, she's still as sharp as a tack and twice as ornery when she gets that way, but um, she was 53 years old until she, before she met a dentist for the very, very first time. 53 years old. I can remember specifically being three and a half, standing on a little stool at my, at my mom's house, and she was teaching me how to brush my teeth. You know, I was three and a half. My grandma never even knew a dentist existed until she was 53. Now, needless to say, I have all my teeth. She has none of hers. But <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that it wasn't part of her reality to even consider dentistry, preventative, you know, dental care, brush your teeth, floss your teeth. It was, just wasn't part of her world. And I believe that it's not part of our world to consider concepts of, of accumulative damage, threshold, if you will, inside of a world because no one has ever told us. No one ever took the time to explain to us that this is how our body works. This is what happens. My God, we had a friend two years ago, New Year's Day, who, who didn't know, Gary didn't know, that over the last you know, 27 years, or 32 years, his body had slowly been closing the arteries to his heart until he was on vacation with his wife in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and he reached for a dinner roll, and before he hit the floor, he was dead. Gary reached threshold. Gary reached that critical point where his body wasn't sending him this message because there was no mechanism to send it there. And no one in this room right now can tell me for sure whether their arteries are wide open or half closed. You have no mechanism. No one in this room right now can assure me that they, aren't, that they don't have some sort of a cancerous tumor growing inside their body right now because you have no mechanism to know that until you cross threshold. So, we can live in a crisis care world and we can wait until the messages come or we can live in a wellness care, preventative, optimum health world, physically, mentally, socially, spiritually, and try and live our life to the best of our abilities. It's up to us. My purpose, my goal, my mission in these talks is to try and at least share this knowledge they have with, with all the folks that will come and listen so that they can get a chance to think about how they live their life. Now think about the implications to this, okay? If it takes this much damage to create a threshold to where we feel the pain message, and we're only focused on the pain, what is going to be continuing to happen while we're focusing on the pain? We're going to be getting worse, aren't we? Right? How many different therapies do we have in healthcare, chiropractic, medicine, dentistry, all the different healthcare providers in the world that focus so much on this and forget about this? Right? I heard a fellow at the health unit tell me the other day, statistically, one third of all the money we spend in our country on healthcare is spent in the last six months of people's lives. Trying to deal with this, letting this get worse all the time. 
Is that a smart system? I contend that there's a better way to do it, that there's another way to look at it. But it's going to come, it's not going to come from a bureau bureaucratic, you know, political level. It's not going to come because some politician says this is a better way to do health care, because that's how they do it in China, for example, right? It's going to come because people like you and I say, you know what, we're not going to do it like this anymore. We're going to change it. Look at the way um, some things have happened in our health care. <clears throat> the birth of children, for example. When I was born, 1963, and I can see some people doing the math on that. Okay, how old is this kid? No. Um, 1963, it wasn't even an option for my dad to be in the delivery room. It wasn't even an option. It's like, you can't be there. Mom was sort of like, you know, strapped down in this, in this bed in this god-awful position, which is totally unnatural to the forces of gravity, right? And um, uh, those, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, forceps were a common thing that was used. Episiotomies were like just routine sort of thing. And of course, you know, modern science knew a whole lot more about, about the body than, you know, Mother Nature ever really could. Um, there are a lot of times the women were, were uh, given those, um, I'm trying to think of the word, where they're basically they're frozen, right? Epidurals, thank you. Uh, where they couldn't actually feel or you know, experience the process and stuff, right? Compare that to now, right? Where the, the dad who's not in the birthing room is a jerk, right? I mean, he's, he's considered a jerk, you know? Um, and, and now the hospitals and stuff are advertising their sort of sensitivity of their birthing centers and, you know, not antiseptic walls anymore, but beautiful, you know, places and rocking chairs and showers and, you know what I mean? That's changed. Did that change because some politician said that was a better way to do things? No, it changed because people were leaving our healthcare system in droves and finding alternative ways to have children, which was way less damaging that, you know, in my opinion, not just physically, but mentally, socially, and otherwise. So is our healthcare system going to change because I say it should or some politician does? No, it's going to change because people like you get a chance to you know, sit tonight or any other place that you can gain this information and say, you know what, I'm not just going to worry about how I feel so much anymore about my health care decisions. I'm going to focus on being the most optimum person I can be, physically, mentally, socially. Because I think when you really understand this concept, I think it doesn't just affect the way you do your health care. I think it affects the way you do your life. I think it reflects on the way you raise your kids. I think it reflects on the way you do your relationships with your significant others or spouses, your friends. I think it reflects on the way you run a business. I think it reflects on a lot of things. So for example, two different ways to look at, say, a relationship, say, a marriage, right? Obviously, if you're in uh, you know, the other side of a divorce court situation and you're going through that sort of a situation, I mean, I mean, you're in a crisis, you're dealing with it, right? Just because you're not in divorce court, does that necessarily mean that you got a good marriage? No. Just because your kids aren't, uh, you know, running drugs on the streets of Montreal, does it necessarily mean that you've, you know, your, your kids are, you know, quote unquote, good kids? No. Just because you don't feel bad, does that necessarily mean that you're healthy? No. So if you're going to put time and energy into being the most optimum person you can be physically, from a health standpoint, you're not just going to put energy into just your physical body, but you're going to put it into your mental body, your, your spiritual body, your social thing. You're going to, you, you know what, you're going to, you're going to be with your friends and you're going to try and do what you can to optimize those relationships. You're not going to find out that Martha hasn't called you in six months because she thinks you're a schmuck, right? Crisis care, wellness care, right? You're not going to wait until you're in divorce court with your significant other, your spouse. You're going to try and do what you can to optimize that relationship before it ever gets that bad. Are you with me on this, right? You're going to try and do what you can with your kids to try and raise them to the best of your ability and do all that you can to love and adore them so that they grow up to be the best kids they can be before they grow up on the streets of Montreal. Are you with me on this? So, because see, I believe that our world is in a little bit of trouble right now. I, I think that our world needs some help. It needs a look at doing things differently. I really believe that. I think that socially and in a lot of other places, our world is in a bit of trouble. And I think it's not going to change unless somebody's willing to stand up and say, you know what, by God, it's time that something changed. And I'm here to do that on this level and hopefully spread that information out through all the other areas of our lives. Okay? Make sense? Good. Last thing is I want to sort of wind this up tonight, okay? <clears throat> there are three types of care that we offer in our office and most chiropractic offices do, okay? And I want to try and explain to you using the concept of, you know what, I'm just going to chuck that blue marker because it just does not work. We offer three types of care. IIC stands for Initial Intensive Care, RC stands for Reconstructive Care, and WC stands for Wellness Care. Okay, let me tell you what those are. Initial Intensive Care is an initial beginning type of care. Probably 90% of the people that we meet in our, in our office come to us because they're in some sort of a crisis. They've crossed the threshold 
their hands numb, they hurt, they're so... <laughs> that was a cheap shot, Anne, wasn't it? <laughs> There's some crisis that they've crossed in their lives and their body is damaged. Why do they come in that way? Because that's what they know they're supposed to do. That's what they've been taught. That's what they believe is appropriate, right? We said earlier, how many people, 95% of the people in this room earlier, when I asked, have ignored a pain message? I mean, almost everybody has. Why would you do that? Your body's sending you a message. You're driving home in your car tonight and the oil light comes on in your dash. Do you pay attention to it or are you just trying to like block it out? You don't put your shades on or something so you don't have to see it. I mean, no, you're going to deal with it. You're going to do something, right? And yet our bodies, we don't. Because we don't want to be seen as a hypochondriac or a wuss or a, you know, oh, it'll just go away on its own. And yeah, truly our body will do what it can to try and solidify that problem so that you don't have to feel it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's correcting it. Okay, so initial intensive care starts with pain. It usually lasts weeks, sometimes months. And its, it's, it's purpose is to try and make enough correction to um, the, the damage that's happened to your energy system such that your body goes underneath the magic threshold, wherever that number may well be, and the pain message shuts off, okay? Does that mean that it's corrected? Does that mean that you're at optimum physiology and function? No, it sure as heck doesn't, does it? Not necessarily, and, and actually very rarely does it because by the time people get here, there's a lot of damage. Reconstructive care is designed to take you to that next step. It usually lasts months to years. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to go in and allow the body the time it needs to repair all the damage. To go in and, you know, I won't do it because my hands are dirty enough, but <laughs> erase all the little circles in here so that the body is back to its absolute optimum function, physiology, mentally, physically, and otherwise. Okay? The last tip of care we offer is a true attempt at wellness care, a true attempt at keeping the body working at its optimum. Okay? That lasts as long as you want to be healthy, in my opinion, my whole life. Right? So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make sure that our energy system never has this interference to it, never has this thing that we call a subluxation robbing us of our God-given ability to be healthy. Now, it's sort of a, it's like a continuum. It's not like you jump from this and then there's like a whole different thing that happens and stuff. It's a continuum that happens. It's like a, a gray area of continuum here. And I believe that the first day you get adjusted in a chiropractic office, you've started wellness care. It's like, it's like my example with Jarrah and her glass of water. I mean, which is the most important, you know, drop of water, which is the most important adjustment. There's no, it's a continuum, right, that runs all the way through. But wellness care starts after your body has reached its optimum function. How do we know that? We redo x-rays, we redo neurological scans, we redo biomechanical assessments. There are an increasingly larger number of people that we come in contact with that choose these options. Are they my options to choose? No, they're your options to choose, right? You decide how, how far you want to take your chiropractic care, how healthy you want to be, literally, how healthy you want to be will define how long you utilize chiropractic care. Because the potential for your body to, to create this nervous system interference is there. Two biggest causes of nervous system interference, or three biggest causes, are uh, physical challenges, lifting, twisting, bending, sitting at the computer all day, whatever it is you do, and then the mental emotional stress that we all live with in the 90s. Those are the biggest damagers to our body, if you will, from a neurological standpoint. Just as a quick illustration for those you've never seen this before, what happens is the vertebrae literally change the way that they move to the point whereby they start to irritate our nerve system. And as I said, it takes a very light amount of pressure to actually create that neurological deficit there that weakens the body, weakens, weakens the cell structure, and allows your body. If you've got a weakened cell structure in your body, whether it's your right kidney or your left big toe, is it more prone to injury or less prone to injury? More prone. Is it more prone to infection or less prone? More prone to disease and damage? Right? You understand? So is this about necessarily finding out that your left kidney has, you know, 30 damaged cells instead of 300 damaged cells? No. It's about optimizing your body's ability to heal itself and to regulate itself so that you just go through the rest of your life being the best you can be. We all have genetic limitations, right? I'm never going to be seven foot three. I'm never going to be black skinned. I'm never going to be Air Jordan on the basketball court watching him stuff those balls from 10. Man, how's that guy do that? I have no idea. But I can be the best me I can be. I want to optimize my fullest potential from all the different areas of life. Okay? Makes sense. How does that affect you and your family? It affects it the way you want to. For me and my family, wellness care began the day my children were born. Actually, it began before that because my wife was, was having her energy system checked, you know, even before conception, but certainly from there to that point afterwards. She was adjusted as a chiropractic term we used to remove this interference all the way through her entire pregnancy. We have four children, as I said. Two were born normal vaginal birth. Two were born cesarean section. All four of them had nerve system interference from the day they were born. Dr. Abraham Talbin from Boston University predicts that in our baby boomer generation, which most of us fit into, 88% uh, of us were subluxated, we had nerve system interference from the day we were born. 
It's like, it's like we're all retarded and we don't know it because we're all retarded. You know, it's, like, it's like we're all functioning at less than we can be, but we think that's normal because that's how we all are. Do you know what I'm saying? We're talking about optimum function. Optimum, be the most, the op most optimum person you can be, mentally, physically, socially, and otherwise. That's what chiropractic cares about. That's where I think the key is to our future. And if I think it real philosophical for a minute about why I'm on the planet, I think the biggest reason I'm on the planet is to try and spread that message so that people can understand there's a lot more to, get to, to life than just scraping by. There's a lot more to just waiting until your body busts before you do anything about your health care. I don't care whether I'm sick or not sick or healthy or unhealthy for that matter. I still, it doesn't affect the way I eat. It doesn't affect my decisions about how I eat, when I eat. It doesn't affect my decisions about whether I exercise or whether I get my nervous system checked because I don't want to wait until I get the pain messages. I want my body to function right all the time. Okay? As I close, I just want to tell a little story about a little fellow whose mom sat in on this exact workshop a couple years ago. Francois, when we met him, was 14, just starting high school, and had been a very unwell little guy his whole life. In retrospect, I think Francois had energy system interference from the day he was born. He was subluxated from the birth process, as many of us are, we just don't know it. He was a colicky little guy. He had all kinds of upper respiratory tract infections and had numerous surgeries for his ears, those little tubes they put in and stuff, you know. He had asthma from the time he was two years old. By the time I met him at 14, he'd been on oral steroids for over nine years of his life. His growth was stunted. He's a very, very short little fellow because of the, what the prednisone had done to his body, just to keep him alive. He was averaging four to six hospitalizations of a week at a time in the hospital with complete lung collapses, oxygen tents, the whole thing, his asthma was so bad. He was on nine medications per day just to keep functioning, just to go through life, right? No hope for the future, no hope for when his, you know, his lights may be taken out, if you will, relying on something from outside of his body being put into his body to keep him alive, right? His mom sat in on this workshop one time, and she said, do you think you could help my little guy? I said, I don't know, you bring him in. If his body has nerve system interference, the potential the body has to heal itself is paramount. Maybe his body has the ability to heal itself. To make a really long story short, Francois, we've been working with him for almost three years now, two and a half years. Within three months, Francois started to go off some of the medications for his asthma. Not because I told him to, but because he just didn't need them anymore. Within three months, he was off six of his medications. He was down to two puffers and one thing he'd been taking off his oral steroids altogether. Within six months, he was down to where he was only taking his puffer when he absolutely needed it. It wasn't sort of a daily thing eight times a day. He only took it when he needed it. And inside of nine months, he was off all of his medications entirely. Francois has not been hospitalized since the first adjustment he got in our office. The potential the body has to heal itself is, is incredible. He was a very, very sick little guy. He's a very, very healthy little guy now. He takes no medications. I say he hasn't been hospitalized. Finished at the top of his class this year in high school. The power of the body is to heal itself is paramount. I take absolutely no credit for what happened to Francois, except for the fact that I was willing to stand up and say what I said tonight, and somebody listened. You got a friend or family member that you would like to hear what we have to say. We do this every two weeks, like clockwork, and there's no charge for this. It's just some of the messages that we want to get out to the world, so maybe we can meet some more little Francois before they get to be 14 and with stunted growth and very, very sick little people. Okay? I'll stay around for a couple minutes to answer your questions. Thank you so much for your time. People in Video Land, it's been fun. We'll see you. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>